Well, yeah, well, welcome to the uh, Daisy special session that we're putting together. Uh, the Mike Ellis uh, uh, is, is going to be leading for us today. It's on teaching with Python and, and the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, just a little bit of preface stuff here before we get started. Uh, everybody, this is going to be recorded. Uh, so that's uh, make you aware of that. Everyone is muted uh, except for Kelly, Mike, and I. Uh, and uh, if you've got questions, then use those in the chat. Uh, Kelly and I will kind of be monitoring uh, what's in the chat. Uh, Mike is focusing on other things presenting today. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to interact and, and if, respond just to you if there's something that way or uh, as, it, as it feels appropriate interact with Mike and, and pose your question to Mike uh, to be able to answer. Uh, part of this is part of our DAISY SIG, the Data Analytics and Statistics Instruction uh, specific interest group within DSI. Um, we thank you for the support that DSI provides for us and the, the, the milieu for, for this all to, to happen and work together. Uh, one of the things, just a couple reminders that uh, there will be, there we've got DAISY sessions that we'll have at uh, DSI uh, 2021, which is gonna be online, virtual again. Uh, the deadline for putting your other, putting things in for regular meeting is, is in fact today. Uh, however, all of our DAISY sessions we put together as invited sessions. And so we've got a little more flexibility I've gotten a couple things come in today, but uh, if you've got something you'd like to be a part of a session, send me an email. Uh, that's uh, randrews at bcu.edu with a short description of what you want to do, and we'll look at it and see if it seems like it's appropriate for our data analytics and statistics instruction, and we can get you in, and that would be a part of an invited session that wouldn't be part of the other sessions uh, that, that's put in for DSI. Uh, so, and the, so anyway, we're, we want to encourage participation. And so I'm going to turn this over to Mike and, uh, thank you and look forward to this. Right. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Let me get, uh, well, uh, I'm, let me get my slide here. Where's my share? So I'm, uh, as Bob said, my name is Mike Ellis. I'm associate professor, and as of recently, the graduate program coordinator here at the University of Central Arkansas, uh, here in the MIS department. Although I do have to tell you, one of the things that uh, we're getting used to now is, as of July 1st, as of July 1st, we are the Computer Information <laughs> Systems and Analytics Department. Uh, this is something we've been working on for, uh, it seems like forever but it's been a year or two. We're dealing with a lot of the things that uh, all of you are, um, trying to grow the program and figure out what direction we're going in and everything. And so a lot of that uh, comes out of this, but uh, we're really looking forward. We're all getting used to calling ourselves the CISA department. So uh, we'll see how that goes uh, moving forward here the rest of the, uh, the summer. So as, um, as Bob mentioned with the, the DAISY sessions, I started going, um, I think it was in 2019, uh, at the DSI in New Orleans. And in those DAISY sessions, I heard this question a lot when we talked about Python and, and R and some of these other tools is, why would you wanna use them when I already have this other tool that I've been using and it's just fine? And my, my like knee jerk reaction was, well, do you want your students to have skills that are actually marketable? But it's more than that, it's, it's not just that, but that is part of it. Um, so there is some benefit, and that's when I got to started started to thinking about it, and uh, talked to Bob about doing something along those lines because I know there are a lot of people that haven't really seen Notebook or or um, Python, and so maybe we could do some kind of demonstration. I will tell you that uh, of course I've used Excel for a long time, and I'm familiar with SPSS, but I had to look up what Jump was after I was uh, at uh, DSI New Orleans. I'd never heard of it before, so. Um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff out there and we, we can't know everything about everything out there. So one of the things that I wanted to do is, is um, as I said, it's more of a demonstration today. 
We've talked about the possibility of doing on a hands a longer hands-on workshop down the road somewhere, but um, we'll you know we'll deal with that when we get there. Uh, but the first thing I wanted to do was give you a little context of what we're doing with Python, and because that kind of leads into a lot of uh, of what we're doing, uh, and then just general why J Python and the Jupyter Notebook. Um, why are the way, reasons other than that marketable skill that we might want to look at using it in class? Uh, then I want to give you a, a, an introduction to the notebook and an introduction to Python in the notebook. So those are going to both going to be in my first notebook file that I have. Uh, and then we're going to talk about pandas, which we use for data analysis and some of the things that we can do. And then do a, a, a pretty basic linear regression problem. That's going to be in my second notebook. So all of these files, I've got a, um, a web address at the end of the slide. Uh, there's a zip folder at that address you can download and get all these. They've got all the, the code except for the one line of code I'm going to type in. Uh, there's a couple others where it can be copied and pasted, which is what I'm going to do. Um, but I'm going to type the first cell, and that's it. And everything else is going to be just a demonstration. So let me... Uh, get on with with that and uh, and then we'll get any uh, if we need to break in and get any questions then we'll take care of that so currently at uh, uca here in the college of business we have um, two different programs for undergrads all we really have is a minor in data analytics that other business well i guess everybody on campus can take but it seems to be limited mostly to the um, the students in the college of business uh, we also uh, a year or two ago, rolled out a graduate certificate in data analytics. It's just a four class certificate sequence with two required classes and then um, four or five you can choose two from. And uh, that has actually been pretty successful so far. Um, we have students that take just the certificate. We have others that do it as part of the MBA program uh, or the Masters of Accounting. Uh, the head of our accounting department has a bit of a technology background, and she's always pushing um, the Python class. She's going to take it, the graduate Python class, actually, this fall. Um, but she's pushing that and pushing the data mining and everything, too. And it's become more popular and more important in accounting. So we get more and more of those students. Starting this fall, we're going to have a BS in data analytics. And then we're going to have an undergrad technical certificate in data analytics, which is um, this is another thing I'd never heard of before, and we started talking about this, and uh, I forget how many hours it is. It's like 24 or 40 hours or something, but it's, it's like taking the major out of all the other stuff, like the common core and all that. Uh, and so if you want to just get some, some of that business and technical expertise at the undergrad level, you can do that. So if, you're, if your major is something else, we've had um, students that are working in um, healthcare. Um, I had a student who's in a, um, a counselor at another Arkansas college who finished the certificate program not long ago. Um, we have people in a lot of different areas that are trying to get some analytics knowledge. And so some of those are to, to reach out to them. The thing that we've been the most uh, anticipatory towards, at least for me, <laughs> is an MS in applied data analytics that starts this fall. Uh, we actually have students that have been in the certificate program that have continued to do other classes while this was getting approved. And we have at least one that's going to graduate this fall in the first semester that this degree has been offered. So uh, um, it is a 30 hour uh, master of science degree. We've got a capstone and a bunch of other stuff. So um, that's where a lot of our efforts have been the last year getting all that set up. We teach with Python at both undergraduate and graduate levels. And I've done uh, all of these classes, but I'm not doing them all currently. Um, the introduction to programming class, uh, I did that one semester, uh, but someone else takes that now. Um, I do the uh, 3335 data analysis using Python uh, and have since the fall of 2015. Now, in the fall of 2015, this was just another introductory programming class. And then uh, we started thinking and said, hey, you know what? We're teaching the exact same things in Python, Java, and Visual Basic at the time. And we even had a we still have a VB and a COBOL class on the books, but haven't taught them in a while. But we said, how about let's redo that 3300 and make it a true intro to programming course. So we decided to do it in Python. And now if you're going to uh, learn programming with us, then that's where you where you start. 
and then now it's more data analysis, more of the pandas stuff I'm, I'm going to uh, show you here today. And then we have a graduate level class that essentially combines the two of those classes uh, for our grad students. We get, like I said, a lot of Mac students, MBA students that know that they want to do something, but they've never coded before. Uh, so I'll wind up with, with 20 or 25 students and usually 80 to 90% of them have not coded before. They're usually terrified. Um, we make sure that everybody knows that nobody else has coded before either, and that seems to calm them down. Um, but they do like Python, how simple it is and easy, and, and we'll see a little bit uh, more of that. Um, I also teach a data mining uh, class in R, um, except next spring, I'm switching it to Python. So uh, I think you'll see from some of the stuff uh, and I apologize up front. Uh, I know when I get excited about stuff, I start talking faster. So by the time we get done, I may be going a thousand miles an hour because uh, I, I really like um, using Python. It's a lot of fun. I've done a lot of stuff uh, at home, little utility things with it. It's, it's, you can use it a lot of different areas. And so we wanted to switch this. Part of it is because we wanted to give some depth of progression to students, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. So you've got Python in 3300, then in the data prep class, and then in data mining as an undergrad, plus as you take it in the 3300, it also leads into Java and the other programming classes. And then the graduate, um, the graduate students get that introductory programming stuff uh, and data prep, and then they get the data mining in Python too. Now, of course, we're not dropping R, uh, we're just moving it to another class so they can get some exposure to that because that's still very important too. Um, a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about um, applies to R as well. Uh, it's just Python has kind of pulled out ahead of R uh, in the last year or so um, as far as popularity. So, uh, and I find it a lot more fun than R, although I still use R as well. Mike, let me jump in with a quick question from, yeah. the, from the audience. Um, sure. What's the difference content-wise between your grad and your undergrad courses? The, the biggest thing um, in those two as far as the, uh, the programming is that 6335 is basically 3300 and 3335 at the same time in the same semester. So it's, it's going to be evolving here as we go. Um, but instead of having the two class progression, because everyone that's an MIS or soon to be a CISA major has to take 3300 um, and they get a progression, uh, we don't have that, that requirement at the master's level. You know, we would, we would love like everybody to be turning students away <laughs> and be able to say, here's the background that you need. Uh, in fact, one complaint I've gotten about that 6335 is that intro to computer science should be the prerequisite. It's like, well, that's somebody that's coded before and they forget that almost all their, their colleagues have not coded before. So that's the big difference there with as far as the coding. The data mining, those classes are done at the same time, but they're gonna be split. So, um, there's going to be a lot more different as we move to Python into a 6,000 level data mining at the grad level. So why Python? You've probably already heard um, a lot of this kind of stuff, and we did a paper on it a couple of years ago. Um, but it is considered the most popular programming language. Lots of stuff is, is done on Python. And the big thing is it's interpreted, not compiled. So if you've ever done any um, programming in some of the other languages where you have you make a change, you compile it, then you run it, and then you see what the problems are, and then you go back and make a change, and then you compile it. So it takes a lot longer for development. Now, when they run, those programs run faster, but the development takes longer. With Python, we'll run it, see what happens, change it, run it again. Uh, so development works a lot um, quicker. I'm going to show you some of this stuff like the indentation, white space, minimal punctuation, not needing to declare variables, um, that throws out uh, or throws off a lot of what we call, you know, the more experienced programmers. So they get used to doing that. And then and it's like, wait a minute, you don't have to declare variables? It's like, no. So you, you'll see. And, and this is a big part of why it's clean and simple. We, we don't have semicolons at the end of every line. Um, there's no end loop statements, nothing like that. Uh, but it does still, you can do object oriented in it. And uh, they're doing some of that over in computer science. Uh, we still do that in our Java class. So we don't mess with it in Python, but you can. And uh, you'll see some of the higher level data types and some of the other functionality that we put in. But when we get past just the basic programming stuff, 
um, it's that extensibility that's so um, valuable. The same with R, where if you need some functionality that you don't currently have, you go out and find it and install it and you move on. You don't have to go uh, buy an upgrade or, or do anything along those lines. So we're going to use some of those uh, packages here uh, today too. So why the Jupyter Notebook? In fact, this is one discussion we've had in our, um, in our department because in that 33 intro class, um, we have uh, the guy that teaches Java uses Eclipse when he teaches that class. Um, I've used both the, Python, the notebook and I've used the idle that comes along with Python. That's just a pretty bare bones IDE. Um, and I think the guy that's teaching it currently um, is using the notebook, but he's not using any of the real um, features that I'm going to show you. Um, but the biggest thing that I started looking at was that it's the environment of choice for data analysis. Uh, again, you know, having them go out and know something that their employers will be able to, uh, um, you know, task them with right away. 40 languages can be used in the notebook, but Python's the default. You don't have to do anything extra. Um, I'll show you when I start, uh, start mine, I have R installed in mine as well, because I do some research stuff and it's, it's uh, easy to do it in the, in the notebook. Um, the notebook allows us to put code and then the explanation about the code, so documentation. Uh, like a scientific notebook, if you were doing a project where you might have some code, some results, some graphs, some sources, all that, you can put all of that stuff uh, in the notebook. This idea, and it's something I keep harping on my students all the time. Um, the first thing is that your code should be easily readable by a person, and then it just happens to run on a computer. Because there are a few things more frustrating in programming, that, in my experience, than trying to go to a bunch of code and then looking at it and not having a clue as to what it's doing. And it's even worse when you just wrote that code three months ago. So uh, that's something that we spent a lot of time talking about. Um, get the comments and the documentation right. And the notebook is a um, kind of a natural platform for that. It also makes it really easy to, to explain that to others, whether it's somebody you're gonna pass your code along to, or maybe you're on a project in a company and you need to make a presentation, um, then you can show what's going on in there. And there's some add-ons and stuff that'll help you clean it up. But um, it keeps, you'll see, if you haven't seen the notebook before, you run code in a cell and it keeps the results right below it until you clear them out. So it's, it's real easy to do. And then another thing that you can't really, you can't overestimate the importance, but it is open source. So it's easy to get, uh, no upfront costs and it's browser-based. Um, the students think it's online, that it's software as a service or something, uh, but I have to keep correcting them. No, it's just browser-based. So. Uh, when you start it up, it opens up in your default browser. You can change all that stuff, but it's real easy, which makes it real easy too to um, look things up if you need help. When I took Java uh, years ago, the professor said the most important thing about programming in Java is to always keep a browser window open. And he meant to go online and search for help when you needed it. Well, that applies to, to Python and R and lots of other stuff too. And um, I just find it really convenient to have them all in the same browser on different tabs. Mike, I'm gonna jump in one little quick clarification. Yeah. Someone is just clarifying for the minor classes, is that also Python? Uh, the data analytics, they can, they can take Python uh, for that. That's, it's not required, but it is one of the classes they can take for the minor. Okay. And, and honestly, we kind of um, steer them towards that and the, the more data centric type classes and data mining too is a is a big one a lot of them find that that interesting but specifically looking at jupyter notebook for teaching um, a lot of the stuff i've already talked about are, are really good but um, it does ex provide that experience because the output stays with the code it's easy to grade so i can actually open a notebook and i don't have to run any code to grade the assignment i can but i don't have to and that makes it a lot easier. When I've, I've got a data mining class right now in summer session, and when I'm grading there, I have to load my R scripts and run them and see what happens and see where the problems are. Um, so that makes it a lot easier. Also gonna show you how cells can help you isolate tasks so it makes troubleshooting and debugging a little bit easier. Um, I find that the um, beginning students, that helps them. 
you know, if you get more than just a few lines together, a lot of times it gets a little overwhelming trying to track a problem down. And then the other thing is that it makes it a little bit easier to impose structure on those beginning students by making them do certain cells and things. And, and we'll see some of that too. So the one thing, and I think this is the last thing before I get into the, the notebooks is we use the Anaconda distribution. You might've heard of that uh, before. You can get Python, the notebook, all the Python packages we're gonna talk about individually. But when you get Anaconda, it installs over 250 of the most common um, packages so that you can integrate them a lot easier. And these are, are just some of the, the packages that are uh, the more popular ones that are in there. And we're actually going to look at today, uh, these with the stars and then a little tiny star next to NumPy because uh, we're gonna, that's the very last thing we're gonna look at is a little NumPy thing. So we're not gonna do much with it. Um, but actually uh, scikit-learn uh, is, is built on NumPy and uh, Seaborn is built on top of Matplotlib. And so there's a lot of different things. You might've heard of some of these. Beautiful Soup is for parsing HTML from web scraping. Uh, you might've heard of TensorFlow and Django does web stuff. And so it's like R and a lot of other environments where if there's something that you think you might wanna do, there's a good chance there's a package out there that'll handle that. And then no licensing issues for classes or labs. Um, I give our IT person for the college, um, basically I just tell her to get the most recent Anaconda uh, install and they put it on the image and then it goes out to the labs. Uh, we were, when I first started doing data mining, I was using um, Rapid Miner, which I like. It's a, it's a good um, program and the beginning students liked it, but we had lots of licensing issues and getting it on the lab computers and everything. It was a huge headache every year. We always got it worked out, but uh, um, but I, I find Python to be more entertaining and it's real easy to, to handle on this kind of stuff. So let me switch over to my uh, screen. <laughs> and uh, so this is the default, the home window um, when you start up the uh, Jupyter Notebook server. And actually let me real quick switch over to that window. So I'm gonna show you when you start up Jupyter Notebook, it actually is running a little server um, on your uh, computer. And this window, I usually just minimize it, but it shows all the things that uh, are going on there. And, um, and then we get to this, there we go, we're back yeah. to this home window. And these are the files that, um, that I have uh, that, like I said, I'll, I'll, are available to you. Um, it's real easy over here. If I'm gonna create a new notebook, I have the new button and you'll see, like I said, I have Python three and R. I can do both. You can create some other stuff, but this is the basic one. And it's just a matter of, of uh, clicking and it gives you a blank notebook, which has almost nothing in it, but we're gonna look at some with things in it defaults to a, a code cell. Um, we can also then uh, open up, let me just open up my first uh, notebook, and we'll talk about that. And I go back and and uh, close this thing. And so this is the default theme. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some other themes here in a little bit, but but this is what comes with it, uh, and and the way it defaults to. Um, so one of the things uh, I wanted to um, add some notes here at the beginning was that. Uh, these two notebooks are actually kind of an aggregation of, of uh, multiple things that I do in those classes I put together as a demonstration here. Um, you will see that there is a lot of text and stuff in them. Um, I made them self-contained. One of the big reasons was for that data analysis class. It didn't have any of the intro programming material in it, and I didn't want to require another textbook, so I just added the coverage in. Uh, and then the other thing was the first couple times I did it, I wanted the material there for my own reference as I was getting comfortable with it. So um, it's essentially almost an interactive book the way that I do it here in the notebook. If you get a book that has code in a notebook with it, it'll mostly be bullet points and things like that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, at some point, I, I might go back to that in class and, and make students uh, work a little bit harder on uh, notes and stuff. So they, um, yeah, so I said, I only use two slide decks in those uh, data analysis classes. I have a first day 
here's the course, here's the syllabus. And then I have a thing of organizing files and folders so that we can all use a standard structure. And then I'm just in the notebook. So uh, you'll see, I do include hands-on exercises where we'll stop and say, okay, you try this for five minutes, 10 minutes, we'll talk about it um, and uh, uh, some other stuff. So some of that is, is trimmed out, but um, you'll see. So as I mentioned before, Jupyter Notebook is, is really an integrated development environment, uh, an IDE uh, for programming. And, and we would normally talk a little bit more about that. I'm, I'm kind of assuming that most of us are familiar with that, but um, just in case we're not, uh, it provides that environment to do programming. It provides some, some tools and things that make it easier to program. And we'll see some of those uh, come up here, uh, different color codings and, and stuff like that. It does not have um, big time debuggers, you can, I think you can add some, but what we're doing, uh, and especially in the data analysis, it, it's not that kind of programming. I always refer to it as coding and not programming. Um, and I, I mentioned the more experienced programmers. I had a couple of uh, more experienced guys a couple of falls ago. They hated the notebook. They hated it all semester. They complained about it constantly. They wanted more of an Eclipse type interface uh, something where they would have debuggers and stuff. And I kept telling them that's not what we're doing here. And I don't think that it ever got through. But for the kinds of things we do, the notebook is way better than Eclipse or anything. So, um, so let's uh, get on with that here. Uh, I mentioned cells. The notebook is, is built out of cells. There are code cells, which is the well, thing that comes up by default when you add a cell, uh, and markdown cells. All of this stuff here is in a markdown cell. Um, those other two cells, don't worry about those. They're, you know, you can read about them, but they, uh, if you try to do a heading cell, it'll tell you that that's not good anymore. So I don't know why it even shows up there. Um, but you can change the type of, of cell here with the pull down menu. Um, that will kind of mess things up. But uh, uh, the big thing about cells is that they can be as big or as small as you want. So I, I tend to keep small groups of code in cells, but you know you could have a few thousand lines of code if you wanted to in a cell. It really doesn't matter. Uh, the cells help you break things into into chunks, um, and that's one of the things that uh, I like about it. Uh, and then no matter whether it's a markdown cell or a code cell, you have to run it in order to see what the effect is. So the code cell is where you. Um, write your code, right? So that's where you write and execute that uh, Python code. Um, everything that you run in the cell or put in the cell is run at the same time. Uh, and then we'll see uh, here in a little bit that um, everything that we run in a cell is still available to us even if we're in a different cell. So that's one of the uh, good things about it. So this is the only line of code that I'm going to write here. And that is, uh, you probably know the tradition of the Hello World program. So I got uh, Dr. Hill, who teaches Java for us, um, to give me a, a picture of a Hello World program in Java. Oh, you know, the other thing, since this is uh, browser-based, I can use Control Plus and Minus to make the, the window a little bit bigger and smaller. Um, so I'll do that, make it a little bigger. Um, so we want to do Hello World in, Pro in Python because of the, um, the tradition of doing that. So, um, so here we go. That's it. So that's one of the nice things of, about Python is that, you know, Java, you have to declare a class, you have to do lots of things. Uh, you can see what that looks like there, the hello world in Java, and we just write a print statement and have it uh, print the um, whatever you want out. So you can also see there that uh, a couple of the features of the, um, of the notebook. One is like any good IDE, it has uh, different color coding for different types of, of uh, code there. We have um, the um, text in our strings in red, the command, the built-in uh, command print, the built-in function is in green, and then a different color green has the, the comments. Um, you can change some of that um, uh, the, with the themes and stuff, which like I said, I'll, I'll come back to a little bit later. So I'm just going to copy and paste this here and talk a little bit more about that. So you see the same thing and you can run a cell by clicking the run on the menu or um, 
control enter runs the cell and stays there shift enter runs it goes to the next cell alt enter runs it and inserts a, a blank cell so it depends on what you're doing on what's um, the way that you want to do it you can also you'll see actually I was, I've got this coming a little bit later that you can run all and all above and all below and lots of different options so you see this blue box around here well I don't know I, I don't know can you see my cursor on there? And, and I yeah, I think I have to go to the... Uh, I can uh, see your cursor. Oh, okay. Um, well, let me get out of that then. Um, so this blue box around the cell tells you that it's the, the current cell. Um, you click inside it, it turns green. So you hit um, run and then here the results seven is right below the box. So like I said, anything that you run in there, the results get displayed right below the box and they stay there until you clear them. Now it also shows you up here, this two in the brackets um, is the sequence in which that cell was, was run. That first one with hello world has a one, this is number two. So that's helpful sometimes seeing where it is that you are in your uh, notebook and maybe that you uh, either need to rerun some cells or just, just ran some things. If you want to add um, a new code cell, we just we just um, have our current cell here. I can say uh, insert cell below, and I'm just going to put this in there and run that. And you see it it prints out this string and the result of what's in my var. Now this shows, like I said, one of the things that's really um, powerful is that this statement in this cell did not refer to what the value of my variable that my var is didn't assign it a, a value or anything it was assigned in a previous cell but it's still there and available for you to use so that's one of the things that really helps you break things down into parts is that you can get you can work on input if you're working on a, a little python program to get input from a user you can work on the input and get that right and then leave that in a separate cell and don't worry about it. But once you run it, you've still got those variables and values available to you later. So you can break it into little pieces. And um, you'll see some of that in the second notebook where we get into some data analysis where we wanna do different chunks of it separately. Uh, that makes it very common. So what you do in any cell affects every other cell no matter when you execute it, as long as it's already been executed. So cells, uh, the code cells are pretty straightforward. Markdown cells are, are something that um, students haven't been using enough on their own. So I'm gonna start forcing them to uh, coming up uh, to document, you know, um, anybody that's taught beginning programmers. And I will say I was the same way when I was doing it. They never wanna write comma, comments. They don't wanna do documentation. They just wanna get the code, let it run. And that's it. And it's like, what do you mean it's wrong? It gets the right answer, doesn't it? And one of the things I always tell them is, just, and I think I've even got it in here still is just because it gets the right answer doesn't mean it's cur it's right. It, it might work, but it does it's not right the way we're talking about it. But in markdown cells, you can put just about anything that you might want to as a um, as a documentation. And with these, like this cell is the current one. Let me go to here. If I double click on this cell, I can edit it. So you can see how all these things are are set up uh, in here. You just use the uh, hashtag or pound sign for headers, and you can go down to six levels. Um, regular text, you can add bold and italics and bold italics and, and uh, all these things. Uh, the tick marks, run that again. It, it gives it highlighted like this, and it looks like um, a, a courier type uh, font. So we do that with code a lot of times, for examples. Um, here I've got this code example like we ran a little bit ago, has three tick marks above and three below and that allows it to look as this little code block. Um, so lots of different things. You can do bullet lists, number lists. Um, <clears throat> you can do a, um, a block quote. For those of you that aren't aware, Python is not named after the snake. It's after the comedy group Monty Python and there is a tradition in Python of using Monty Python sketch material uh, in examples. And so I do that in a lot of places. So if there's anything weird like these examples that you don't know what they are or they don't make any sense, 
that's why it's it's from Monty Python uh, skit. So um, I have some students that know it, most of them don't, but uh, you know, it keeps me entertained. So uh, anyway, bullet lists, number lists, easy to do. Um, you know, here we show the the block uh, quote. You can include pictures. Um, it's and it's real easy to do. There's a an edit. You have an insert image. If I was in editing that markdown cell, um, you can also use HTML uh, and and CSS type codes to change a lot of the uh, different codes that are in here. Uh, there are a lot of places where I have. Um, um, some different text that might be bigger or different color, uh, like I had the um, this box back here. You'll see that's pretty easy to do just with, you know, some um, formatting stuff in an HTML type tag. So it uh, helps you brush up on your HTML and CSS stuff if you're uh, if you're a little rusty on that. But that's if you want to get you know fancy. You don't have to, uh, but all these things can be done in here to help document um, what's going on. The notebook by default um, saves every 120 seconds. And so you'll see up here in this title bar, it says unsaved changes uh, because it has not been saved recently, but pretty soon it will have that it's been saved. Um, it also saves checkpoints, although a lot of times you get checkpoint failed, which is not a big deal. Uh, I looked into it before, it has to do with I think it, I'm using Firefox, and I think it might even be with Firefox or something, but uh, I, I haven't worried about it because I know it's not a big deal. You can also you know, save and uh, all that. When we leave, we go to, there's checkpoint failed. I guess because I've made this text a little bit bigger, it's, it's kind of squishing things out a little differently. Um, when we're done, we go to close and halt. Uh, otherwise, it will be running in the background in that, that server. Um, but uh, we'll I'll do that a little bit later. Uh, I mentioned there's other stuff in the notebook menu. Um, in the view, there's, uh, I'll show you in the next notebook, the toggle line numbers. You can have line numbers in there. You know, it's a lot easier to say on line 27, I have this problem rather than, you know, after the print, but before this, I did this. And uh, so that's, that's really helpful. We can toggle the toolbar and header and stuff up there. Um, the kernel, you see this kernel choice uh, is the engine that runs behind the scenes that actually runs the Python and creates the notebook and all that stuff. Um, one of the things I really like about uh, the notebook is the fact that everything is right there and it stays with it is students all will often give me the question, we'll talk about something and say, well, what happens if I do this? And my response is always, I don't know, why don't you try it? Let's see what happens because they're scared to death that they're going to mess something up, especially if they're on the lab computers or they've got a, a brand new computer that they just got. Uh, they think they're gonna mess it up. I always tell them the worst thing you're gonna have to do is restart the kernel. Uh, and that just kind of, you know, is, it's, you don't have to restart. I haven't had yet anybody have to completely restart their computer, um, but restart the kernel, clears out the, uh, the variables and everything, and then fix it and, and run it again. So, you know, we'll, we'll do that every once in a while. I mean, like learning anything else, sometimes you've got to um, back up a little bit, but uh, uh, the kernel works, being able to do that is, is really handy. There are some other ways I mentioned to run the cell. They're available in the cell menu uh, and also as these keyboard shortcuts. Uh, we can also um, toggle the outputs like here with I can clear current outputs or all outputs. So that's what I do when I'm creating a notebook that I'm going to give to students. I'll go in and clear the code that we're going to type during class out, but then I also clear all outputs so that they don't already have the stuff that is going to be generated that we're going to do in class, uh, but then they can do it. Of course, I have it in my notes so that I make sure I'm going the right direction, um, but that's an easy way to prepare something for going into class. So there's lots of, that's really the, uh, the notebook. Um, <clears throat> the rest of what we'll talk about in this notebook is some, some Python standards, and then go to that, uh, that other notebook and talk about a little, some of the data analysis stuff. And that's actually the more fun stuff, but um, you know, you've got to cover the basics. 
So there's lots of uh, guidelines and things for Python, although it's a pretty um, freewheeling uh, language. Um, you know, like I said, hammer on them about doing uh, comments. It uses the pound sign for comments in a code cell. Um, but the nice thing about the markdown, of course, is that you can document it beyond just a comment. So the students usually are not familiar with comments and that whole concept. And again, you've got the different colors here. Um, we'll talk about the indentation of white space here in, in just a second. So um, I run this to show them that, you know, all these comment things don't show up at all. It just, um, just the results of the, the print stuff. So there's, there's certainly nothing wrong and definitely um, encouraged to write comments. I've had some people come from computer science that swear to me that there's somebody over there that makes them comment every line of code. I think that's excessive, but if that's what they want to do, then, you know, that's fine. Um, but I'd rather they do that than not write any comments or just write print here or something like that. So that's, that's an ongoing battle if you, uh, if you teach intro programmers. So some of this thing about the white space and indentation uh, actually show you in this next example. And let me, I need to back that out just one notch to make it fit. This is just a, a, a simple little program with a couple of defined functions, it just converts temperatures. There's nothing special about the program or anything. Again, you can see some of the, the IDE color coding um, that Python does, um, but you see these functions are defined here uh, here's the, the line numbers I talked about that we can go to um, toggle line numbers. We can turn those off, but I don't see any reason to uh, leave those on. So lines seven to nine here is just the definition of a, of a little function. And the way that Python knows that that function definition is done is that there's a blank line and then the next line of code isn't indented. So it knows that everything that comes after that def keyword and then the colon, that's one of the few places where we have punctuation required. But everything that comes after that that's indented is part of that definition. And then when it's not indented anymore, it's something else. And we'll see the same thing in this if block and the for down here, that as long as it's indented, it's part of that code block. Uh, but once it's not indented anymore, then uh, it's done. So we don't have any end if. We don't have any end loop, uh, anything like that. Like I say, that's a little jarring if you've done a lot of programming in a lot of other languages. And, and I've, I mean, back to after school and high school, um, I did programming, a little bit of programming on basic on a Trash 80 um, long time ago. And then Fortran and I mean, Java and C Sharp, C++, I mean, and VB and all that stuff. So uh, it takes a little getting used to, but uh, it's, it was intended to be a very simple, easy to use language. And uh, I, I think it is. And like I say, I, students tend to like it. Um, so this, this whole thing is uh, one cell. And so we've got two, two function definitions uh, and then the code that runs it. Well, but we can always go here and we can say split cell and we can have the function definitions in one cell and run those, and now those are available to us, and we can do whatever we want in this other um, line of code, in this other cell, and run that, and um, just tell it whatever it is that we want to do. So we're going to do 50, how many degrees? Let's do two degrees and uh, eight pairs. And again, now, this output stays right here, right below the code that produced it, um, until we go up and say, you know, we can say, um, you know, clear the current, if that's our current cell, clear current um, outputs, or we can clear all outputs, but it stays there. So that's my teaching note here that I, I was repeating. It makes grading easier. So when we have the problems, I try to break my problems into multiple steps and get them to do them in separate cells. And then, so it makes it a lot easier to grade. I have them turn in the, uh, the notebook, I can go down and see what they've done. And if it's right, if it's not, if there's some kind of problem, I can run their code and um, see if I can help them figure out what, where the problem was, uh, where they went wrong. So uh, it makes it, I find it to be a really helpful tool uh, for teaching just because I can run the code, but I don't have to. 
I just, I, I don't know, for some reason, it seems to take up so much time to be running the code all the time, even if it runs in just a second or two um, uh, in other, like in R or um, one of the other languages. So uh, it's, it's nice to not have to do that. Um, like I said, I have some stuff in here about naming variables and things. Um, there's lots of that. I'm, I'm on them about coming up with a standard and using lowercase um, and the underscore. Um, the camel case, if you've used that, is not used so much in Python, but it is considered a, a variant. Um, the, there's one standard, instead of underscore using a period between words, uh, if you have multiple words, I hate it. Unfortunately, it's Google standard, <laughs> so you're going to see it. Um, and they do any of their training stuff is using that, but um, I, I don't understand why they would do that because of the way the, the period is used in web addresses and, and um, you know other stuff that we we use it in. So, um, it kind of stuck with it. <clears throat> uh, again, um, harping on them about um, you know make sure that it's easy to read and document it and if anybody ever uses a, um, an X or an A or anything like that, I, I jump all over them. So uh, they only do that once. Uh, sometimes I've done a couple of examples where using A, B, and C for variables makes sense, and I make sure they understand that it makes sense. But uh, uh, beyond that, it's to put a meaningful name um, so it's, it's self-documenting. The uh, language sta standards are actually uh, in this document. And here's another reason why I like uh, the notebook is being um, browser-based is I have this link. Um, I don't have to shift windows or anything. It's been really good on Zoom. I just go to that and I can, I can look at whatever the documentation is. We can talk about it and I can go back to the tab. I don't have to open up other windows and keep opening slides and all this kind of stuff. Um, so that's very handy. Um, I include links to the docu official documentation wherever I can. Um, so, you know, they can go or not. Uh, again, a Google search um, works very well. Uh, got some examples about some good and bad uh, variable names. Um, but let's talk about data types a little bit more. So there are a few data types. We tend to use um, a handful uh, regularly. Um, <clears throat> but the typical Boolean and integers and floats and, and strings and that kind of stuff. Um, the date time, we tend to get into it a little bit more in pandas, and I don't really have anything to talk about with, with that today. Um, lists and dictionaries, though, are um, really important, both in regular Python and then when we get into data analysis. Um, but I mentioned before about how we don't, in Python, have to declare variables up front. In some, um, in Visual Basic, it's the only one I can remember uh, <laughs> out of all the ones I've, I've programmed in because it's some of them been a long time. But we use a, a keyword dim for dimension, D-I-M, and then you say the name of the variable and what type it is, and then you can use it. We don't have that kind of statement in Python. Um, we declare the variable when we first use it. And Python determines what kind of a variable is based on what follows the equal sign. The equal sign is the assignment operator. And so whatever's on the right side of the equal sign is gonna get stored in the name location that's on the left side. And Python looks at what is that data and then stores it in that variable with that data type. So you can actually change data types on variable names if you store different kinds of data in it. That can lead you down a, um, a path that's not the greatest way to go, but uh, yeah, have to be careful. Um, and I talk with students about how if you put quotes around it, Python says it's a string. Uh, if you don't, it's a number. And you can see with the IDE, it's different colors here. Uh, so that gives you an idea. Uh, and if you run it as strings, it just concatenates it, puts it together. Um, if you run it as numbers, then you know it, you get a result the way you were expecting. Because now you can do math on it because it's a numeric variable. We can convert and do all that kind of stuff too. but. Um, that's, that's something that uh, I found that the beginning students uh, get focused on putting quotes around strings and things, and then they put in numbers and a lot of them forget that you don't put the quotes around them. But it's without having to have that declaration statement, 
it's just whatever it is. So here shipping is going to be a string variable. And then here now it's going to be a float variable. And so it, it changes on the fly. Um, yeah, if it, there's no decimal, it's an integer. If there is a decimal, it's a float. Um, most of the time it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but uh, we don't want to harp on that too much. Um, we have string data types too. Uh, remember everything is, uh, can use anything that's run previously. But like I said, lists and dictionaries are, are more interesting. <laughs> so lists are, um, are, are kind of like an array, but not really. So there's some technical reasons why they're not, but uh, if you're comfortable thinking of them as an array, then, then you can do that and you're not gonna hurt yourself unless you get way into the technical aspects. But you create a list and it can have, um, it can have the same data type. So this has uh, four strings. It can have strings and numbers intermixed. Uh, it can have other lists. Um, you can have lots of different things in it but I can, um, I can run that. So movies is going to be in memory and we use uh, the index and it is zero based index. So you may have some experience with that. So Scarface would be at index zero, the blob at index one and Star Wars at index two. So if we call movies and those are square brackets, we use square brackets a lot in, in Python and pandas. And uh, we can get the element that's at index two. You'll see that this cell has out 11 in there and shows the output. When we just display a variable value, it'll put that. You'll notice, you might remember earlier, if I did a print statement, it doesn't show the out part there because that's just saying display it to the screen, but it'll show the out if you're just displaying a, um, a variable. And of course, when I ran this cell back here with the, where it created movies, there was no output. So uh, didn't it just loaded that into memory. Dictionaries are um, an interesting little uh, data structure. <clears throat> um, with the list, we have to get them in sequence, but with dictionaries, it's called a key value pair. So it's, it's, you can think of it as a little database even. Um, you have a key and then there's a value at that key. And the way that you get that value is by referring to the key, just like you might um, get a, a student's name by referring to an ID number. Uh, same thing, whatever that uh, value is, you get that key. And keys can be anything. So here, I create two dictionaries, employee and offices. And in the first one, the key, uh, this first key value is one and the value is John. And then the key is 23 and the value is Eric and so on. In the second one, the key is John and the, the value is COB201 and, and so on. So we can use that and we put it in square brackets in order to access the value that's at that uh, location in the dictionary. Um, and I always ask students, what order is it, is it stored in? Well, you can see when you create a dictionary, you can print out all the values and it, it might be in a different order than what you put them in. But the key is you don't care because it doesn't matter what order they're in. You can only get to them through that key value, that key value pair, get the value by putting in a key. And you can also, type out all the keys and all the values and do lots of other things. But uh, in this case, um, I put those, those calls to the um, elements of those uh, dictionaries in the print statement so that they don't overwrite each other. If I didn't put the print, they would, the, you would only see the office's Eric uh, results because it'll just show whatever is the last thing there. So both of them, uh, lists and dictionaries are um, interesting. Of course, we spend like entire days talking about those, but uh, that's just a little brief intro. We'll talk about them a little bit more in the next um, notebook. I mentioned too about shutting down the notebook. I look, it was auto saved, so I don't have anything uh, changed. Um, I can, I go to close and halt and it'll close that down. And then that's not running anymore. You might've seen, I went ahead here, um, untitled, whenever it's running, this, this icon here turns green. Let me open that second notebook and go back. So if I'm back here, now this is green, that shows, and it has running over here. So it shows what you have running. I've had multiple notebooks running before, as it's typically not too big of a deal. And you'll see over here on the right, the they tend to be small because 
they're mostly the text in there. I, I believe it's actually um, a, a JSON file is what it winds up being is how it's uh, organized. I've looked at it a little bit and said I wasn't curious enough to look any further. So I'll, I'll go ahead and let it uh, manage all that behind the scenes. Mike, let's pause really quick before you um, move to that sure. second example. Um, and uh, I know you um, that are watching, you can't actually talk, but I just give a second if anyone wants to type a question, um, just give folks one second to regroup um, before sure. we jump into that second one. Uh, there's been a couple um, uh, exchanges back and forth about Jupiter Lab. Um, have you ever tried Jupiter Lab? Yeah, Jupiter Lab is um, the um, what what's going to be the the tool moving forward. It takes a lot of the notebook stuff, but it's in a little different format. So it's been there as the replacement for Jupiter Notebook, but they it's never been established exactly when that's going to happen. Uh, but it, it works basically the same way as far as the, the code and everything. Um, you get you wind up with a um, um, more of a, a window on the left, like a navigation window with your files and stuff instead of going back to the home page. And uh, to me, it's it's not really a, a huge difference, um, but that is supposed to be the, the the tool that's going to be out there. But it's been it's one of those things that's in perpetual beta, I think, is. <laughs> Is, so it's it's out there and I've, I've played with it a little bit, but uh, you know, until it actually replaces it, then I'm not gonna worry about it. You know, there used to be also a Python version two and a Python version three. There is no Python version two anymore. It's not supported anymore. It's just the version three. Uh, it's out there and used, but as of uh, January 1st of 2020, I think uh, it's not supported anymore. So uh, don't worry about that either. Do you have any uh, textbook recommendations for Python programming or Python data science? I have a couple on my last slide when I go. I'll go oh, perfect. Back to that. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, all right, Mark, I'm sorry. This was actually our little planned break. Um, so we were kind of taking this little moment to pause before. So, so run really quick and um, we'll let Mike uh, get started here. I'm looking really quick, I think the textbook question. And then someone is asking about Google Colab. Um, and so that is not something we're covering today, but um, um, uh, Bob and I can look at that and see if that's. Uh, yeah, I've heard of it. I haven't haven't really done anything with it. Yeah, I mean, if, if somebody's, you know, Mike's volunteered to do things, we're a volunteer organization. And if you've got something that you want to do, certainly, uh, Love to have somebody if you want to try to do maybe not quite as long, but do a session uh, for uh, DSI for 20, 2021 or get right year. Uh, then love to have you to do that. If you've got you've got something that you want to do, uh, send it to us. And if it makes sense and seems to fit this audience, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll get you in. Or, or if you want to do something similar to what Mike's done, he's setting a precedent here. Uh, we can set up one of these uh, at, at some time that might be appropriate also. I will say in my defense that I just talked to Bob about doing a session at DSI or Southeast DSI, and then it, it wound up being this. So, <laughs> Thank you, Mike. If, Thank you very much. But if it much. pays <laughs> off, then great. <laughs> I just did a, um, a, a more hands-on workshop before our deal last Tuesday uh, for the Arkansas Center for Data Science. Um, they do some training of um, uh, employees in the area for some of our um, companies that are using these kinds of things. Uh, they do a, uh, I think it's a 16 week sequence and every once in a while I do a, like a guest lecture thing. And so I did a, a thing on four hours on pandas last, last Tuesday where we were typing and all that stuff. Very cool. Yeah, this is very, very useful. All right, I am not seeing any other new questions, so I will um, I will give you some control back now then. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, like I say, insert the wheel cliche here, you know, don't, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's lots of stuff out there. Um, I have been amazed at, uh, when you think of something that maybe you could do, I've been amazed to find that there are often packages out there, so. Um, you, you can dig around and find stuff. Uh, packages like Pandas and Seaborn and Scikit-Learn and Stat Models are all very well documented, very uh, lots of experience with them. 
uh, they're really kind of at the core of, of things that are done. So we're going to mess around with those and show you how those work and, uh, and how I use them in, in class too, um, uh, moving forward here. So I'm just going to show a few things, some plotting and some descriptive stats here. And then I'm going to load the data set from a CSV file, do some uh, data prep things, and then show you a linear regression at the end using two different, uh, two different tools. So one of the things that we do when we have to use a, a package in, um, in Python is we use an import statement. And one of the things is, you know, I've been harping on students to make um, meaningful self-documenting variable names and everything. And then now I'm going to type in import pandas as PD. I'm, gonna, I'm aliasing pandas so we can just say PD. And the thing is, that's the standard way that it's done out there. Same thing with Seaborn. It's done as SNS. So you won't, you'll always see them aliased as those things. Um, but by doing those, it makes them easier to, to use. So we'll see that. Um, Pandas takes a little bit to uh, actually uh, load up. But um, because we had the Anaconda installation, it's already on, on the system. And all we have to do is say import. If we didn't have that, we would have to go out to the pip tool and, and install it, which is still not exactly debilitating. But um, but it is nice to have it all there with Anaconda. Uh, there's an Ana Anaconda navigator that you can go to. You can see all the stuff that's in there, and it's it's um, pretty impressive what's there. There's a little data set that's in uh, Seaborn called Tips. It's Restaurant Tips, and a lot of the packages that are out there include a little data set that you can use for examples. So I'm just going to uh, get that data set out of there, and then we'll uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, data frame is going to be familiar to you if you use R. It's the same kind of an idea, uh, but it's the main data structure used by pandas. And pandas is really uh, the heart of um, data prep and, and uh, getting into modeling stuff. So pandas is uh, the big daddy there. Uh, the data frame is essentially a table that's in memory. Uh, it's made up of a line series and all that, and, and we don't need to get into that uh, here. Um, but when you understand how the series work and how they're aligned by the, the uh, key values, then it, it makes it a little bit clearer on how things go. But because of that, we can split the data frame up into separate into columns and do different things. And then actually, they'll go back together and line up. Uh, if you've ever accidentally had some data in Excel and you forgot to include a column in your sort, um, you don't have that problem if you separate the columns here. So, and I've done that plenty of times. <clears throat> so, we're just going to take a quick look at that. And, you know, here, uh, the pandas documentation is uh, at this link. There's also the help menu has links to several um, very common uh, packages and, and things that you can get help to. And like I said, we click on it, it comes up in another window and I'm just one tab away if I need to, to look some stuff up. So you see that TIPS is a, um, is a data frame. So we'll talk more about the data frame as we're um, messing around with it here. So there's a lot of stuff built into that data frame object. Uh, it's, a, it's a data object defined in pandas. Um, and a lot of times, of course, we want to take a look at our data and see what it looks like. We can open it in Excel or do other things, but we can do lots of stuff to, to look at it quickly here in, um, uh, in the notebook. And then, again, whatever we look at is going to stay there. So head shows the, um, the first rows, five by default. Uh, you can put in a number and, and display more or less um, rows. Tail does the last ones. Um, one of my favorites is uh, info. It gives you a lot of uh, info about the, the data frame. So it, it tells us uh, how, many rows that, how many rows we have, what their indexes are, um, how many columns, and then the names of the columns. It tells us the non-null. So by looking at the difference between uh, this number and our non-null, we can see how many nulls we have. And it also gives us the data type out here. So we have a couple of floats, an integer, and four categories. And it also sums that up on this line, too. So with the bigger data sets, uh, we can get a, a pretty good view of, of what's going on there. 
uh, there's another one that's a favorite of mine that we'll use here in a little bit. But I, I use head and info and that other one all the time to take a look at the, at the data. And I've been trying to um, encourage the students and I'd already forgotten, but describe is the other one that I use all the time. I forgot that we were going there uh, right away. But you see, it gives us descriptive statistics um, for the variables that are there. Now, in this case, uh, we have those four categorical variables. It does not include those here. It just does the num numeric variables. Uh, and you can see why when you, you see what the results there are. But we can look at um, the categorical variables. We can look at them individually if we just refer to a column. And like here, this is how we refer to one column in uh, the TIPS data frame. Uh, square brackets, and then the name of the column in quotes, either single or double quotes. This is actually a pretty good place for me to talk about something that I, I spend more time on in class, which is the idea of um, a concept that I read about called um, minimally sufficient uh, pandas. The idea is pandas is huge, and there's lots of stuff, and there are a lot of different ways that you can access. I will tell you, I don't tell students this, I can tell you because I think I can trust you guys. You could also do tips.day and you can access that column. The problem with that is it doesn't work all the time. Square brackets and the name in quotes always works. So that's the only way that I show students. Uh, and I talk about minimally sufficient pandas because um, I've gone through and eliminated some things that are, are I've picked stuff that I think are going to work best. So that's another thing is, you can look stuff up online, but you have to stick to what we covered in class. So if you do something that's completely different than what we did in class, it's wrong. And I don't care how good it works, it's wrong. I'm trying to teach you a way to think logically through this and use these tools, and then you can go branch out. So we have a textbook and, and all the notes and stuff for a reason. So if you choose to not look at that, then you know that's on you. So. Um, you know, you can be as hard nosed about any of that as you want to be. Uh, I just, you know, we've gone to a lot of effort and talked about this stuff. If you just pay attention and apply it, it's going to be easier than having to go out and, and search for it on, on your own. So we can look here with this value counts um, uh, method that's built in at just what the counts are for that uh, column by specifying the, the name of the data frame in the column. Or we can use describe in this include all option. And it's kind of ugly to look at, but um, you can see it, it puts those four categorical variables in it. So uh, if you want something quick, um, that's a relatively easy to do thing to do. Uh, another thing that you're not going to see because I'm not typing is that there is autocomplete. So once you get three or four letters, um, you can hit tab and, and suggestions will come up to complete based on what's in memory. and, and available methods and all that kind of stuff. So um, you see that in most tools now and, and um, the notebook has that as well. So there are some different um, packages available for plotting. Uh, and this is another uh, minimally <laughs> sufficient uh, idea here is that uh, I used to talk about Matplotlib and Seaborn. Seaborn is built on top of Matplotlib um, but you can do different things depending on which one you use. Uh, but I decided to go strictly Seaborn uh, because I thought I was talking about too many different things. Now, I've considered going back to Matplotlib. So there's, there's not one just real uh, jumps out at you option, but I've been narrowing down what I talk about with plotting um, more and more each time we do the class uh, for the simple reason that uh, we're talking here primarily about exploratory plotting uh, which doesn't need to be very fancy. So uh, in these classes where I'm doing data prep, we're talking about take a look at the data, learn something, and move on. You're not getting it ready to present to the board or something. So, uh, But you can, uh, just like in R, you can generate publication-ready um, plots uh, using some of the tools that are out there. I have not gotten far enough in there to do it, but uh, adding titles and things like that is no big deal. There are also different color palettes available. And this became an issue uh, a couple of springs ago um, because as we were talking about themes and color palettes, I had a student who said, hey, I've got a color blindness issue. And some of these defaults were coming up with both red and green. And so he couldn't tell the difference. And um, if you've done anything with data visualization, 
uh, you know that most tools have gotten away from red and green and have gone to orange and blue as default colors for just that reason. Um, so I had not looked it up and had not found out anything about it because nobody had mentioned it. But uh, you may also know that a pretty sizable amount, it's like eight or eight and a half percent of the population has an issue with colorblindness. So it makes sense to uh, make a change. So I'm not going to run this cell just yet. I'm going to come back to it in just a second. But you can see, you can change the palette, you can change the styles and things. Uh, and once you do it one time, it'll change it for the rest of the notebook. But I'm going to do a couple of plots here with the defaults, and then I'll show you the, the change and, and also why you might want to do the, uh, the change. So another thing in the, uh, the book that I use for um, this class with, with pandas and everything uh, goes into a lot of other plots, like violin plots. And um, I can't even remember a couple of them uh, because I had never used them before. Uh, and so violin plots, I know a lot of people in analytics say they're the greatest thing ever. Um, OK, uh, like I said, I don't have any history with them. So I try to focus on the basic plots that students might need, bar charts, histograms, scatter plots, uh, and box plots. And um, I really think that the first three especially, uh, they're going to see a lot of. So it's pretty straightforward to do just a really basic little um, plot. Uh, the big thing is knowing which functions you call. So with the uh, bar chart, if you want to look at a categorical variable, then uh, this is the generic format that we use. We um, set it to an uh, AX object on the left side, and that's going to be displayed. SNS, remember, is Seaborn. That's how we, so we're saying Seaborn.CountPlot. So count, call the CountPlot function that's in Seaborn, and then pass these arguments. Uh, the, we use an X variable here, uh, and then we tell it what the uh, data frame is. And when I run that, I get a, a pretty simple little box uh, or a bar chart. And you can see by default, it has a red and a, a green bar next to each other. We can also do uh, histograms. It uses a little bit different, um, um, it, well, actually very similar um, um, syntax between the different um, values, but in this case, um, I'm just telling it to use this total bill column that's in tips by using that square bracket and, and quote um, syntax again. And dist plot is the uh, default there. And you see, you not only get that histogram, but you uh, get a density curve and stuff on there too. If all you need to do is take a quick look at your data, then that's perfectly fine. But you can also specify the number of bins that you have in your histogram and take that curve off there if you want to and uh, just have a little simple uh, five bin histogram. Now, let me go back since we saw a couple of those and set reset that palette to the colorblind palette. And that will be the palette from here on, at, uh, here on out. And let me rerun this cell. And you see it gives it a little different um, color scheme. Maybe a little bit easier. I don't think it changes these uh, at all, yeah. But so it'll change it a little bit and it won't default to have that red and that green right next to each other. You can also look at a box and whiskers plot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that all the stat stuff here that we're all familiar with that and we'll just take a look at uh, some of this. Um, so box plot actually is the function box plot in SNS uh, in Seaborn. We specify the Y variable, and I, I think you'll kind of see why that is, <clears throat> because it's um, you know done vertically. Uh, if we want to do a horizontal box plot, we just make that an X variable instead of a Y. Uh, if we want to do multiple ones, then we can specify an X and a Y. So we have Y uh, to do vertical, and then X is a categorical. So we do separate plots on the different values of that categorical variable. Uh, that was uh, time of day, and it uh, it's either lunch or dinner. Those were the only two uh, times that were in there. But it follows the same syntax. We have we tell it the variables we want to do. We have some options, and at the end we tell it the uh, where the data is. So it's one of those things. Once you get it down, then it's uh, pretty easy to follow through there. 
you just have to remember what it is that, uh, you know, which functions you have to call. Scatter plots can get a, a little bit trickier because we can do a basic plot with the function scatter plot. And, uh, and it literally just shows the, uh, the scatter plot. If you want to put a regression line on there, which um, you, know, you can do in Excel and lots of other programs, and it almost seems to default like that, then LM plot and reg plot are uh, the way to go. And they have different uh, characteristics to them. And this is one of the things I find a little frustrating is that why can't just one of them handle the stuff and then that be it? So I, I hopefully someday that will be combined. Um, but they offer you some different options beyond um, scatter plot. So you can kind of see, I can just barely keep a little bit on. They look a little different, um, but you get that uh, regression line and it includes a confidence interval on there. That's the, the blue haze is the confidence interval for the regression line. You can't with LM plot, you can't customize anything, but with reg plot, you can. So like I said, why are, why are there two versions that are so close and yet they're different? I'd, I'd like to see that go away, but um, <clears throat> I'm trying to, uh, I may get away from just the scatter plot because you can put in, uh, you can take the, the uh, line out and just get a scatter plot. So we might in the future just use LM plot or reg plot and, and not even worry about the other two just in, the, in that uh, minimally sufficient uh, idea. Another thing that I like, especially if I'm looking at a data set that I'm gonna create an assignment with, is this pair plot. It shows all the pairwise relationships. And in this case, it's going to be just the numeric variables, which didn't take too long to run since we only uh, have three of them. Um, but of course, the more we get, then the, the more crunched down all the results are and the longer it takes to run. But it can be kind of handy to, if you want to do, a, a, if you find a data set, you want to do a regression problem as a homework assignment, then uh, you take a look and see, well, is there any suggestion that there's any kind of linear relationships in there? Um, and and uh, you know, go from there. So I like that one for just checking things out. Another thing that I, I didn't mention on about the notebook stuff is that, you know, we've said that the output is left here. Well, when it's longer, I can click over here and you can see click to scroll output, double click to hide. If I click once, now I've got a scroll bar and so I can make it smaller or I can double click and it hides it and you have an ellipsis here in the middle. So it's still there. I just click it to make it show up, but now it's out of my way as I wanna move. It's, it's a little less cluttered for my interface. So lots of little uh, things that we can do. We can also add um, hue and color um, for different variables. And this just kind of throws a bunch of stuff in here. Um, so you see we have um, COL, I said hue and color, hue and column. COL always feels like it should be color, but it's, it's actually column. So we're looking at time, lunch and dinner. We put them in separate columns in the output. And then hue is the different colors of the, um, the way that it's plotted. So you see we have that by smoker. And, uh, and this doesn't have a bunch of stuff added. This is just what happens when you put in those arguments. You see, we get the little uh, legend over the right and we get the, the titles up above. So pretty straightforward for generating uh, plots. I have students do that on um, most assignments once we've covered plots is uh, even if it's not a big deal, I'll have them plot something just to remind them that you've got to keep doing this. And just because you, um, you know, did a plot like this, you know, three weeks ago, that doesn't mean that uh, you can forget about it. So I said, I'm gonna load um, some data in that uh, CSV file that I have uh, in there and um, run some regression stuff on it and just kind of show you, this is where I'd eventually be going. We're going to do a little data prep in here to, before we actually run the regression. Um, so you see some of the stuff that we do in pandas uh, and I do in those uh, those classes. Um, here again, a link to read CSV. Um, but one of the things to talk about is, you know, uh, CSV is just comma separated values and a CSV file is just a text file. There's nothing special about it, which is actually great because that means that essentially any program can open it. 
So one of the things that I'd like to emphasize in analytics is to use CSV files as often as possible. Um, pandas can open Excel files and, and Oracle files and all these other type files. Um, but I always tell students, if you've got a data in an Excel file, go into Excel, save it as a CSV, and it'll just be a little bit cleaner. You don't have to worry about um, a lot of uh, potential issues. In this case, I've got that employee salary CSV. We call, um, remember we did import pandas as PD. So I'm gonna access pandas, the function that's in there, read CSV and tell it this um, CSV folder that's there or CSV file that's there. And it's going to read it and it defaults into a data frame. So we'll see when we um, look at the, the first few lines here, let me expand that out. We have the first eight lines. I uh, had head with eight in there. So we got the info tells us about all of these different um, columns and, and the different data types, and then shows what the columns look like. Now the numbers on the left side are a row index. And um, we can get into that if we're looking for specific rows and stuff, but uh, uh, not, that's not really going into that kind of a detail here, but that's what that is, is a row index. We could also, like this ID number, we could assign that as the row index instead of just those integers. If we don't give it a row index where we read the value, the data, then it assigns those uh, sequential integers by default. So you can see um, we have, uh, Gender is in there as an object. Object is a pandas string. So the names are slightly different in pandas so they don't um, clash with, with Python names. Um, birth, the B date is an object, which we could change that to date. I'm not gonna do that, but um, we're gonna change gender and minority to categories because minority is zero or one for a yes, no. Uh, and gender is um, M and F. And you see, we've got some missing data in there too. Um, so there's a few things that we need to clean up in, the, in this data before we can uh, do anything with it. So one of the things that we can do, uh, yeah, if I run that uh, describe includes all, we can see uh, some more of that. You've already seen in this that the way that, uh, that uh, pandas represents a missing value is with NAN for not a number. Um, it's represented a lot of different ways in, in different programs, and we can actually handle it uh, in different ways as we read it. This, in this options for read CSV, line three is missing data. There can be no value there, and I think there's at least one in that table, so there's absolutely nothing there. It can be NAN, it can be none, which is in Python. Um, uh, R, I believe, is NA, uh, or if you've ever worked with people in psychology, I've had a bunch of them use minus 999 for missing values. And uh, uh, so you can specify that that's your missing, uh, that's also a missing value. So by default, when we run read CSV, it replaces true nulls, NA and NAN, and it does them as, as NANs, but we can also specify some options here. And I'll just go down here to this statement. Um, <clears throat> that uh, we can tell it here, like here on line four, here's some other values, minus 999 that we want to treat as missing. Uh, but we also want to keep the default operation. So we want the NA and NAN and a true null to be uh, missing. We can also parse dates. Oh, I guess I am converting that here in the read statement. Forgot about that. Um, so we can tell it that B date column is supposed to be a, a date and it'll treat it that way. And it'll also take that ID and make it the index column. So we can deal with all that stuff up front here by reading that data again with those other options. And so now we'll see um, we have, here's our uh, index values, um, which don't have to be in any numerical value, but we can see them down here in the, um, as we show some rows, the ID is the index. Um, uh, gender is still an object because uh, we're going to fix that yet. And minority is, is still an int because it's zero and one, but we fixed uh, date time. And then we'll also see that any place where it was missing is now NAN. So now pandas knows that that's a missing value and we can do something with that NAN value um, either one at a time or all at the same time. 
So if we've ever worked with any data from just about anybody except a, um, a kindly professor, we know that there's always problems. There's usually missing data and, and bad data that we have to fix up. Um, we don't go real deep into the whole, uh, how are we going to, are we gonna impute values or anything? Um, what I talk about in my data prep classes is we have missingness, we have to deal with it. Here's a couple of ways to do it, but there's, uh, you know, you can spend a lot of time going into the weeds on the stats on coming up with uh, how to replace those. So one thing, of course, you can do is drop it. Um, usually not a good idea unless you've just got a, a few rows out of uh, a huge data set. Um, some cases, you may be using an analytic technique that doesn't care about missing data and you don't have to worry about it. Um, but most of the time we want to fill it in with something. So we can tell it with this fill NA that's built into the um, data frame. And in this case, my data frame is called um, EMPS. I guess that's what I, yeah, I read it to EMPS. I, I tend to use EMPS for employees. Um, so <clears throat> we have a data frame called EMPS and we can call fill NA for filling missing values. And then we specify what value we wanna um, put in there. Now there's an, this is another place, there's another method that will work to fill missing values, but you want to stick with the fill NA. But in this case, it's going to change all missing values in all columns, and we seldom want to do that. So what we do is this is where we might use a dictionary. There are lots of other places too, but we might want to um, use a dictionary to fill things in. So in this case, we're going to say, well, there's more males than females. Some data sets, we get a huge disparity. Um, we just had a paper worked on where it was like 85% female. So in that case, if you want to fill in missing values with female, that's probably safe. Uh, here, <laughs> maybe not as, as valid, but uh, just want to talk about how to replace them. Uh, and we'll worry about the statistical validity and, and, uh, at some other time. <clears throat> but in this case, if we want to fill in all the missing gender values with a male, we create uh, we can actually use this dictionary here in the, the dictionaries in the curly braces. And we can put that directly into the fill NA statement, but I like using this intermediate variable uh, way. So let's save this dictionary to the intermediate variable fill values, and then we'll put that in the, um, uh, in the statement where we're going to replace it. Let me, I should have uh, changed this. So you can see here that we're gonna save gender as the key, M as the value, and that's gonna be the fill values. <clears throat> and so we'll see there were some gender values missing up front and now they have M in there. The thing is, if we, if we check the results, well, wait a minute, gender has only 470 non-null, so that means there's four null values. And if we look, here they are. So that is actually, this is another thing where those, those uh, more experienced programmers just really hated it. Um, it essentially, like uh, in a database, it gives you a view of what the data looks like with this change, but it doesn't commit it to the data frame. So it doesn't actually save it. We use this in place equals true option to store it in place, or we could save it as a, a new data frame, but um, I don't like doing that unless I have to, because then we wind up filling up memory with all these different data frames. <clears throat> so like those guys always said, so we have to tell it that we're really, we're serious this time. It's like, yeah, actually we do. The same way when you want to delete something, it says, are you sure you want to delete this? It's the same thing. It's to keep you from making a bonehead mistake. And we all make bonehead mistakes. So it gives you a, a chance to check it out before you commit it. Of course, again, one of the nice things about having the notebook or a or a script or whatever is if you do mess it up, you just go back and rerun all the cells before that, get to that point and then do it the right way. So you can see that now there are no null values in, in gender that's uh, been saved to that uh, object uh, and everything is, is, uh, is there and looks like we're good to go there. And there's, there's lots of tools about imputing, but like I say, I'd, um, that's one of the last things I want to talk to a, a beginning coder about uh, is getting into the stats of all of that. We also had those couple of columns that were the wrong uh, data type. 
especially if you have categorical data that's coded as um, as numbers, you know, it will read them in as integers. And so you need to change that to uh, categories. Uh, lots of pandas functions expect categories, um, but they just tend to work better if you specifically make them categories. And all you have to do is uh, you know change the type. And in this case, just saying, let's take the uh, gender column out of EMPS, run as type, and change the type to category, and then save it as that, that column again. So essentially doing it in place without that in place operator. So we can do that. I don't want to hide. If you have anything highlighted and then try to run the cell, it often will give you an error. This time it worked. Um, but uh, uh, so I, I try not to have anything highlighted. But you see now gender and minority are both category, uh, so it takes care of it very, uh, very easily. We'd also like to take a look. So here's a couple more visualizations. I threw a couple things together. So uh, a box plot shows that it's uh, pretty skewed. Um, do two different gender displays, salary different by male and female. Uh, unfortunate, but not a big surprise to anybody. Um, we can use different markers. So in this case, uh, we saw before, you, you may not have noticed, um, but the actual points were kind of fat before and it made the whole thing kind of fuzzy. We can change the markers that we use. In this case, I'm using a period, but if I use a plus sign, it'll put plus signs there. Uh, you can put um, diamonds and triangles and all kinds of different things, all kinds of options uh, that you can look up. <clears throat> we can also do a, uh, another split. And so we can take a look at um, you know, the different minority values. So you know any of the uh, stuff that we might need to take a look at the data before we really get into it. So we know there's some differences here. Um, we can poke around a little bit and see what happens. So I think I mentioned before, we're going to use two different packages to, uh, to do this, stats models and scikit-learn. Um, Scikit-learn is really a, a machine learning library, and it's a little more bare bones, but stats models is going to look familiar to, uh, to most of you because it produces output that looks like most statistical packages. So um, I say if you're going to, if you're using this to talk about uh, more, the stats are more important than anything else, then I would use stats models, or if you're using it for research, I would use that. Um, but if you're using it for, to build a machine learning model that you're going to uh, use somewhere down the road, then, then scikit-learn is probably the, the way to go. Uh, but you'll see the, the difference in it. Uh, there's some background, like I said, from my student stuff about the multiple regression. I've got some links. Um, it does use, I, I see the, the time here. It does use R-style formulas. So you'll see that here in just a minute. If you're familiar with R-style formulas, it'll, it'll feel comfortable. Uh, you can do it other ways where you specify individual parts, but um, I, I like the R style uh, formulas, uh, so that's what that's what we're using. We're just going to use ordinary least squares, and when we get that, we uh, import it in this way. So we're just using the formula, the API portion of the formula portion of stats models. A lot of these packages are so big that if you import the whole package. Um, you're just gonna you're gonna use up a lot of memory you don't need. So the um, the tendency the uh, suggestion is that you just bring in what you need. So in this case, a lot of times people will bring in stats models, uh, and it's just gonna be aliased as SM, and so the stats models formula is SMF, and that will give us access to um, uh, running that uh, regression with stats models. A little bit about R style formulas, if you're not familiar with it. It has the uh, dependent variable on the left side, uh, the tilde, the little squiggly that's uh, to the left of the one on your uh, keyboard. Um, and then you have the independent variables uh, listed with plus signs in between them on the right. Uh, you create that with formula, tell it the data, and, um, and that creates the model. Then we run the fit method, and we can look at the results. So you see it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, to get that result out of there. So do it with con do a couple of the continuous variables first and, uh, and then look at scikit and then add some categoricals and uh, kind of wrap things up. <clears throat> so if you haven't imported pandas as PD, but we did it earlier, so remember whatever we ran before is still there. 
So we tend to put those import statements at the beginning of the notebook. If you know you're going to need stuff, you almost always need import pandas as PD uh, and go ahead and load them up and then you don't have to worry about them. And then also if you have to rerun the notebook, it'll load that first and then uh, come on down and get to where you need to go. So line nine here creates the model specification. Uh, line 10 runs the fit um, method of, of that uh, resulting model and storing it in the variable called results. And then we run, or it's actually an object there, and we run the summary method of the results object to display it. And so we do all that when I run this cell. And like I said, that should look familiar. So you get most of the things that, uh, that you're used to getting if you do a regression analysis in uh, some other uh, software. So we, we have uh, you know, all the typical coefficients and p-values and r-squared and, and uh, all of that stuff. So like I say, if you're using it for research or focusing on the statistics part with students, then I would definitely go with this. And then let's take a look at what comes out of scikit-learn. Now, scikit-learn, like I said, is really intended for machine learning. There's lots of different machine learning stuff in it. Um, there are a couple of things. One is that we're not going to use those uh, R formula uh, type specifications. Uh, and then we call it scikit-learn, but it's actually sklearn is how we call the library. So there's a lot of different scikits, and learn is for machine learning. Uh, but there's, there's other scikits that you can uh, get to out there. But it also has a, um, a pretty structured um, basic syntax so you can build this and, and reuse it. So I have to import the library, but of course, once I've done that, then I'm, I'm good. Then we create a linear regression object by calling this linear regression function, which is an ordinary least squares. Uh, and then we specify the fit. We have to uh, list out what, uh, which columns we want to use, which variables we want to use. Uh, and then we can take a look at the results. So it runs the, um, the same thing, the sklearn import takes a, a little bit uh, of time. And so not nearly as uh, nice an output as we get with stats models, but it's the exact same values. So if we go like the minus, um, one, well, 1 1.6726 is, um, this coefficient. The minus 78 is the intercept. That's the last one. So we have the two coefficients and then the intercept we get down there. Uh, and that's just because that's what we asked for, coefficients and the intercept. <clears throat> it doesn't have a format where it's going to do all that on its own. So that's I say, if you're doing this for research or something, you really want that other output. Or uh, if you want to look at it. otherwise, you've got to do some other um, coding in order to get the uh, it in a little better format. And that's the last thing we're going to do uh, at the end of this. But um, but it does the, the exact same thing. You get the same same results. Now, if we want to have a, a categorical predictors like we did in there, um, then we'd want to create some dummy variables. But in the analytics world, they're referred to as one-hot encoding. You'll see dummy variables sometimes. But one-hot, as in if it's there, it's a one. Uh, and if it's not, it's a zero. So we'll, we'll take the, the dummy variable stuff as, uh, uh, take it as read here. Um, so what we can do is we can look at what are the different categories and create those dummy variables, except stats models actually does it for us. So another good reason to use it with uh, the stats or if you're using it for research. Um, and it's, it's also very helpful for beginning coders uh, to not have to go out and do these separate dummy variables before they do it. So what we do in stats models is we still are using that F, um, the F type formula, or R type formula, excuse me. Um, we just add in with plus signs those, those categorical variables, and then stats models does the work. Uh, one of the things I, I also always make sure with, especially with the uh, uh, beginning program programming, when we run this kind of stuff, is to make sure that they understand what all is going on behind the scenes, because it's real easy for us to put that in. But when you think about all of the stuff, the way that the data frame is looped through, um, of the way it's creating those 
um, dummy variables, all the other stuff. There's lots and lots of stuff going on behind the scenes that we can access um, just out of that uh, stats models um, package. It also removes um, the first value and makes it the reference value. So gender, uh, this will be for male and in uh, relation to females and minority, this would be a, a one as opposed to zero, which I'm assuming is yes versus no. So those other values are the reference levels. And then uh, these are the, the values that uh, it shows here in our, our model. Um, we don't have any p-value issues here, but there are a couple of problems I, I work that do have some, and we can talk about some of that. Um, of course, one of the things, uh, p-values are still important looking from an anal analytic standpoint, but you might have run into this. Uh, the big thing when you're when you're looking at an analytics model of uh, like with regression of um, how good is it, it's not just having p-values under a certain level in R squared, it's which model does the best job of predicting what you wanna know. So you have test data and you run it and you may have some variables that have p-values over 0.05 and your, your stats person inside you is gonna to wanna to fight that. But if it gives you a better prediction, that means money out in the world. And so we're not looking for a, um, a strict cause and effect. We're looking for the best prediction. So that's another thing to kind of uh, keep in mind uh, when we look at something like regression. Now with scikit-learn, if you want to add categoricals, you do have to create uh, the dummy variables. Um, Pandas has this function, get dummies. And um, what I'm doing here is putting in all of the variables that I want to use in order to, to create this model. And if it needs a dummy, then it'll create one. But like Sal Begin and, uh, and the education one, they don't need dummies, so it'll just forget about it. By putting drop first equals true in there, it'll make the first um, level the reference level. And so you'll see that um, now we've got gender M because it dropped gender female and minority one, it dropped minority zero, because those are the reference. And, um, and then we can use those to fit the model the same as before. Um, just saying which it's EMPS dummy, because we just put the variables of interest in this EMPS dummy um, data frame. So we just say all of them there and uh, try to predict salary out of the uh, EMPS. Uh, and then we get all those values. And these are the same values as we saw out of stats models, um, you, uh, it just doesn't provide them as neatly there. But as I said, the last thing I do here is if you want to do better SK learn output, then this is the code you need. <laughs> I wouldn't rewrite it. I would just reuse it. Um, but it does use NumPy. And like I said, pandas and a lot of other things use NumPy underneath um, numeric Python. Uh, it has a lot, uh, it has a, an array in there that is used as the basis of a lot of data um, structures. Uh, and we can do a lot of things with some things in NumPy that we can't in Pandas. So it actually uses this NumPy array um, and puts the values together and adds some, um, the names of the, uh, of the values that it puts. So you can actually get something that looks a little bit more um, comfortable uh, you don't still don't have all the p values and all that, but um, you can get all of that. You just have to dig in and, and get it. But again, if you're going to create something that you want to um, be predicting something out in the world with, uh, this probably is going to do a little bit uh, better job and be a little bit more efficient rather than the, the stats model version. Um, and you can access all those different uh, parameters that you need to. So I have a, just a couple of slides I want to uh, talk about to wrap up here. So I've mentioned a couple of things uh, that I'm going to make changes in my classes. One is I'm putting more emphasis on constructing the notebook and documenting um, what's going on. Because like I said, all the new coders never want to write com comments or documentation. Uh, and um, it usually they have to stumble and, and run into something that they wrote and they have to change it and they can't remember what they did. And at some point it drives it home. Uh, I'm trying to get them there a little bit quicker, but that may 
be a fool's errand because I know with me, you know, I had to mess myself up a couple times before I finally bought in. So um, the other thing is we've seen with Zoom, and I'm sure that uh, uh, most of you have too, a, uh, an increase in academic integrity violations. And um, with any kind of coding, uh, it's pretty easy to, to share code. Uh, if they have at least a little bit of imagination and change some variable names, it's hard to come back and say, hey, you've got this code. Um, when they have the same misspellings in the exact same comment or something, it's easier to find uh, and have found that in the past. But um, uh, Dr. Hill, who does the Java, includes an integrity statement in his um, code. And, and I'm going to start doing that too. Uh, it's like, you can use outside sources if you have to look something up, but I want to know who or what it was. Uh, and then I want you to pledge that you wrote this code. So hopefully it'll at least make them think twice if they're copying somebody's. Also, because of that progression in a try to extend the data prep experience from the, the 3335 and 6335 into the data mining class, that may take a couple of years as we get some prerequisites and stuff in, uh, in place. Um, so <laughs> I said Python and the notebook can uh, combine the code and documentation, which make it real easy to handle teaching and to be able to, uh, to use. It's browser-based, free to use, easy to expand, don't have any problems with budgets, don't have any problems with computer labs. It's easy to grade the assignments because the, the code stays there. Somebody I had talked to uh, before said that they have them turn in the HTML version of the notebook. Um, the only issue with that is you can't run the code anymore. You can see the output. Uh, I have them turn in the IPYNB file that is the notebook, and so then I can run the code if I need to. 80% of the time, I don't need to. Uh, but there are some that, that I need to uh, help. Um, and then, of course, the students get marketable skills with both the notebook and uh, with Python. Um, and so that seems to be uh, helping down the road. We have had some employers, we've talked to them a lot over the last two or three years about tools that they're using. Um, and we were talking to, I believe it was uh, Dillard's IT, Dillard's the uh, um, department store. They're based in Little Rock and was asking a manager there what tools they use and they were talking about different stuff and I asked if they were using Python. Well, not too much, we're using a little bit and we start talking about something else and then she said, it's your students. We, your students are using Python here and we're using it a lot more and then she got excited about it. Yeah, we are using it more. And so you know, a lot of companies are, are trying to bring it in and it's just a, another skill that you can uh, uh, give to the students. And I find it to be really fun to, to mess around in Python versus a lot of other languages. Um, let me real quick, those are the two textbooks that we use, this 3300 one, Tony Gaddis, starting out with Python. That's the new fifth edition uh, that I think just came out. So I'm, I'm not familiar with that one. I've used the fourth edition. And then in uh, the other two classes, I use Pandas for Everyone by Daniel Chen. Um, I've even had students say, hey, this is a really good book. And uh, th uh, that doesn't happen that often in my experience. So uh, they, unfortunately, they said that right before the midterm. And I said, yeah, you were supposed to find that out a couple of months ago. But, um, uh, but anyway, uh, so really like that one. Um, <clears throat> this is my email and then this rather long, uh, uh, address there. I've got the zip zip file there. Uh, if you want to get the uh, the notebooks and the um, the slides uh, from today and the the data um, file that's there. Um, beyond that, if we had any other questions or anything, I guess I can stop sharing. But maybe I'll leave that up there so my email and stuff is is there for right now. Uh, we did yeah. have one. Someone asked if um, you do any kind of hackathon or. Um, thing where students kind of work on a project? No, but I, I think that's in the future. Um, uh, everything I've seen about those is very positive. Um, and we're going to, as with this MS, especially for the grad students, we're going to more projects and things. And, and our capstone is going to be get some data and you've got to do some stuff with it with multiple techniques. Um, so I, I think as we get more there, uh, a hackathon would, would, um, would make sense. Um, I think anybody that's looked into this kind of understands that there's a there's kind of an analytics continuum from the business end on one end uh, to the data science, highly technical on the other. And like a lot of people, we're figuring out exactly where we are on that um, continuum. 
And I think we were a little closer to the middle and we're moving a little more on the business interpretation side. So, um, you know, there's nothing wrong or better or worse about either end, but you kind of have to figure out where you need to be and, and, and target that. So we're trying to be a little more on the business interpretation, but we do a lot of coding. So we're, we're working all that out. All right, I believe that is all the uh, uh, questions I have. Um, again, the um, uh, 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 link, I also put it in the chat there, um, okay. takes you over and it has the zip that has the slides and also uh, the new book, uh, the notebook there. Um, oh, someone is asking, do you have your students run notebooks for their exams? For the final exam, I do. Um, I, and, um, let me see. In data mining, I have them do conceptual exams, but we are going to switch to doing more coding. Um, what I do, I tell them the types of things. So I'll tell them, um, you're going to you get the data frame. You're going to have to do um, maybe a, you know, a, a scatter plot and a, and a bar chart about something. You're going to have to um, you know, do something about data types and some other things and let them prepare because you know, no programmer pulls everything out of their head, right? As they're doing it, they always have something. I let them do, when we're in the labs, which we're supposed to be again this fall, I let them do one page of notes and uh, uh, used to be, uh, they all had to be handwritten, but not this way. You can print stuff out and uh, and then, um, you know, build your notebook. You've, you've done this, you've done it. And part of the is to see who's actually been doing the coding and who's maybe been copying it from somebody. So uh, if, yeah, if you fall down hard on the, the final, then, yeah, then you deserve a lower grade. So, um, and, and I try to make it substantial, um, 30 or 40% at least, uh, just to catch it. But I tell them up front, look, you, if you've been doing this, I'm gonna tell you what's on it. It's not gonna be a problem. I'm gonna give you two hours and most of you will be done in 45 minutes. So uh, try to take some of the stress out of it. But that, I mean, we've always been talking about love to do coding on exams instead of multiple choice type stuff. Um, but it's so hard. The tools that are out there to auto grade code are not that great that from what I've seen. That Gaddis book actually comes with a tool, my lab that we used in an earlier version. And some questions would have 30 or more correct versions on it. And I would still have a student that would code it correctly and it would be counted wrong. And so I finally said, forget it. So when you've got 35 correct answers and they find a 36, it's like, yeah, the tool's not worth it. Yeah, very good. Lots of um, thank yous and um, good jobs uh, are coming through for the through the chat. And again, I think um, we will try to get this recording and um, email it to the people that were on the, the sign up for today. So even those, if you know someone that missed, we'll try to get this out to share. Okay. Yeah, and, and like I said, that's like a, a, a at least a semester's worth of stuff in about an hour and a half. So, uh, you know, feed you with a fire hose. And um, but it's easy, you know, it's no cost to get the Anaconda installed. Lots of help to get it installed and play around with it a little bit. Um, and uh, I've done, um, I did some code at home to, I had some iTunes music that still had the digital rights management on it. And I wanted to find out which songs. I did some code there. I did some code to add some little date boxes to some pictures that I was making collage out of. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that, uh, you know, all kinds of different packages, but it's great with the data. Bob, Bob you're I muted. All right, there we go. Now, Mike, I just add you, uh, uh, thank you for this. Uh, I think one of the things the number of people that stayed on the whole time is, is a good, good, good message about how how well you've done and how you put this in a way that that we can understand it and hopefully provide people with something that they may they may choose to run with for the <laughs> for the fall. I think at this point in time, those who teach in the fall, what am I going to do? How am I going to do things? And I think you've you've done well with that. I just a reminder everybody at that. Uh, that DSI for Daisy sessions. We put these together as invited sessions. And if you get something to me this week, randrews at vcu.edu, 
we can put it up. Uh, I know Dimitri had put something up here. He's looking at, at uh, teaching some classes with focused on particular uh, applied disciplines, accounting, other things. Anybody got something along those lines and like to participate in a session with him, he'd be glad to have you. Uh, you can just send that to me and we'll, we'll put him in touch and, and, and do those or any other ideas that, that you have. Uh, what we can do, this is just a volunteer organization where all of us in here about better data, analytics and statistics instruction. And uh, so thank you, Mike, and just a, a, a big round of applause for you and, and what you've done here. Well, thanks, Bob, and, and thanks to everybody who, uh, who came and, and I hope you got something useful out of it. Um, you can get started and, and you know, you may find yourself stuck in Python like I have and don't wanna go anywhere else. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, I think that's, that should be good. So I think we'll, I don't know who all closes this up, but uh, anyway, Vivian will be the one that'll take it and put it up. So thank you. All right. Bye.